Thank you for having me. I'm going to take over the screen if you don't mind. Perfect. All right. And uh, let's go at it. So good afternoon, everyone. And unless you're on the West Coast, then it's good morning and uh, happy to be here. And uh, thank you for having me back to talk more about the issues that are close to my heart and hopefully your own. And that is uh, uh, our cardiovascular mortality. But I, I think even at the end of a pandemic, if we are indeed at the end of this uh, uh, hybrid issue of, um, of uh, Omicron splitting into two different uh, mutations and combining together, well, you know, we may see some more of it. Uh, but I think the principles that I'm going to talk about today are going to be sort of um, lasting throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so I have entitled this. I think it's not really fair to talk about something like nutrition and cardiovascular mortality, which I've done at Real Truth <clears throat> for so many years without addressing the pandemic. Um, and that is because uh, you'll, you'll see why when I get into the data. Um, but it, we are really in the middle of, uh, or hopefully towards the end of a dual pandemic and, and uh, nutrition is key to actually helping. And so if I can um, just, uh, just to set this up, um, Dr. Mosafarian, who's at Tufts and is Dean there in nutrition, uh, we had a wonderful symposium last week in the American College of Cardiology. And I actually borrowed some of his slides and hopefully he'll borrow some of mine um, just to talk about, um, you know, because I, until I saw this, I kind of thought that because I was a cardiologist, actually, uh, I didn't update my CV. I'm actually taking over as chairman of medicine at um, University of Louisville. Um, but I've always thought for, you know, 40 years, I thought as a cardiologist. And so, of course, even though tobacco use is big and dietary risk is big, high blood pressure, which of course is diet, uh, high blood pressure was always the number one cause of cardiovascular mortality around the world, including the at-risk populations, the United States, dispro uh, disproportionately in the African-Americans who therefore have a higher cardiovascular mortality than other, other races in the U.S. Um, but now that I'm an internal medicine chair, I have to kind of like back off and start thinking uh, more globally. And dietary risk goes far beyond cardiovascular disease. And it is the number one cause of poor health uh, if we look at the United States burden of disease. What are the results? We have one out of two Americans having diabetes or, or prediabetes. Three out of four are overweight or, or obese. So we've kind of combined those two um, in modern lingo, uh, calling it diabesity. And we, we have diabetes uh, coming in very large numbers. Only one in 10 are metabolically healthy. Uh, and when we look at what's uh, about to happen, that is the uh, what's going to happen with our uh, our next generation, when one in four uh, are actually overweight or obese, one in five have prediabetes, fatty liver disease is happening uh, because when you're making yourself fat, it does involve your organs. What we haven't focused on, and I'll just throw it out there, uh, is that um, the visceral fat, as it's called, that is the fat that's on the inside of the belly. Everybody can see the, the fat that's on the belly, um, but that so-called inside or internal fat actually starts to happen around the heart as well. And so the epicardial fat, as it's called, the uh, visceral fat actually does result in worsening of coronary heart disease. And, and so everyone who's getting a CT scan these days of their chest, uh, hopefully in the next few years, everyone will have that little parameter measured because it's such a, uh, a reflection of future risk. Okay, so uh, we could talk about the weight of the problem, but we can also talk about the cost of the problem. And uh, the, we have one of the worst healthcare systems in terms of how much we spend uh, and how much um, we get out of it. And so we have, if, if, if the United States is a wonderful place if you get sick because our healthcare system is actually really good, but it's not a great place to be well. That is we, the way we, I will talk about marketing food, we'll talk about food consumption, we'll talk about uh, congressional um, uh, subsidies for unhealthy foods that affect our population. And so our costs are astronomical compared to the outcome that we have, even though we have an amazing uh, ability to take care of patients. We have pharmaceutical industry that is absolutely unparalleled around the world, 
but they also charge us more than they do other places. And, you know, they don't, they don't gonna get mad at me for saying it out loud because they admit it. They say that all the research and development uh, comes from the United States and for the entire population of the world, it seems. And so this is what we're up against. You know, instead of roads, bridges, and education for poor people, we're spending it on, um, you know, healthcare because of the choices that we all make. And so putting, setting it up in the uh, pandemic, I'm going to talk over and over again about uh, inflammation and the fact that um, there are factors inside our bodies that are controlled by nutrition that result in the major risk factors that make people have a bad outcome from COVID, diabetes, hypertension, um, diet-related diseases. And this is something that we could, if we had jumped on this, and you know, everyone talked about it just a little bit but they didn't prioritize it as, as far as I could see. We were all talking about it in our academic circles and we were talking about it in nutrition circles. And you had PCRM without one, uh, Neil Barnard's group within one month of the beginning of the pandemic coming out and saying, hey, fruits and vegetables, everybody. And so we'll talk about it, but the fact of the matter is we did not jump on this fast enough and many, many people died because they were continued to do the kinds of things that make us in terms of nutrition, obese, diabetic, hypertensive, and high cholesterol. Now, if, I do need to back off. We had problems before the pandemic. We had this issue of 195 countries published years ago that the biggest risk factor for dying and, uh, and disability adjusted life years in the hundreds of millions was actually due to dietary factors, uh, including sodium, uh, low intake of whole grains, uh, low intake of fruits uh, and vegetables. And so these are things that could have been, that we could fix around the world but I have to focus on the United States because look at this graph. This is life expectancy versus the dollars we just talked about. And the United States is so such an outlier compared to everyone else. That is, we spend more money and get the, the worst outcomes of any of the developed uh, world. And this is something that we can't be proud of. And it's something we have to make interventions of. And I'm saying spend less. I'm saying be healthier, live longer, uh, and that way we will spend less. So we have to start with prevention. Back to COVID for a moment. Uh, this is a nice complicated slide. You know, you might want to, you know, snap a screenshot if, uh, if the real truth people allowed that. And just, just take a look at all the things that led to susceptibility of COVID-19 because it's going to happen again. Maybe it'll be 100 years like the Spanish flu, but it'll maybe it'll be something else. And, you know, uh, all of the um, pandemic issues are related to so many things that we could have fixed. Uh, having poor people um, uh, who have in food insecurity, eating unhealthy food, sedentary behavior, um, but uh, having the uh, obesity and overweight and, and people being undernourished as well. Um, and that is, you know, people talk about food deserts, but there's also food apartheid where you have good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. And you also have, you know, you know food, the, essentially that really should be uh, not consumed because it's not nutritious. And we, we will go through all of this and, and what the biological effects of these foods are, but ultimately we have to recognize that this complex issue that we've had with, uh, with COVID-19 and mortality really revolves around nutrition uh, and our lifestyle. And so uh, the, um, you know, one of the things that we always point out is how they, everyone jumped on the people of color uh, dying more of, uh, of COVID-19. And it took some very insightful people to say, wait a minute, is it race? Is there something genetic? Well, first of all, we know that the genetics between blacks and whites and Hispanics are you know, pretty much all identical anyway, with very few uh, uh, genetic differences. And so um, you wouldn't expect that there's gonna be some increase of susceptibility to a virus. And sure enough, when you look at things like uh, low income and obesity and kidney disease, when you look at things like that, then you find out that actually being black in a couple of their models, the, the, for those of you who are not used to hazard ratios, if it's less than one, that means protection. If it's more than one, it means increase. Well, the, the biggest model that included all the risk factors that they could put their hands on showed that being black actually had about 11% less chance of dying. If you can correct for all these things, the problem is that the black people had poorer kidneys and higher C-reactive protein, and uh, they were actually uh, uh, more obese. And that really is the issue. It isn't, it isn't race, it's risk. 
And so that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Hopefully everyone heard that. And we stopped talking about it as if it's a, a racial issue. It's social and uh, demographics, as well as uh, the, the uh, issues of health and obesity. So let's talk about obesity for a minute and nutrition. Uh, because we've had this diet, this data, and those of you who have been watching, and I know this is a 17-day uh, course, and you may be coming in and out, but you should be familiar with the idea that there are some pretty broad swaths at, at, uh, at research and nutrition, and it's hard to get two people, even in the same camp or similar camps, to agree completely on everything. And, but the fact is that if you compare a plant-based diet to one of those diets that kills you uh, basically the, by eating a lot of animals, uh, uh, which we'll go through later, you know, you, you can lose weight on any of them. Why? Because people are lowering their calories. But the question is, how do you sustain it? And it turns out that the data very clearly from Mike Danziger published years ago says that plant-based nutrition gives you a better shot at maintaining that weight off. Now, how about um, diabetes? So I'm not going to spend overwhelming amount talking about any of them, but I want to talk about um, diabetes because the data is very clear that the if you were to do an intervention, just like the obesity data, you do an intervention with plants, what you end up with is lower hemoglobin A1C. That's a measure of how high your sugar has been for the past couple of months. And you, if the only one that didn't seem to work very well, this one study was not completely plant-based. Instead of low-fat vegan, it was uh, lacto-ovo-vegetarian. And so there is some data saying that compared to other, di other om omnivorous diets, if you switch from red meat to dairy, that your diabetes risk goes down. I'm sure that's true uh, just because of the effects of red meat. But when you're comparing dairy versus plants, um, it's going to lose every time. How about blood pressure? really important to take this uh, data to the bank because it's a massive amount of data. It's, in, it's been infused into our guidelines, um, our 2017 hypertensive guidelines. I was happy to be in the room and be part of the authorship of that and to ensure that we had all of the data that says that when you do a plant-based intervention, you're going to see a dramatic drop in, in blood pressure. Now, the good news is the blood pressure is going to get better. The bad news is the rest of those guidelines have been largely ignored, not just the changing the definition of hypertension to 130 over 80. That, that got ignored by a lot of people. But the request that we stop doing blood pressures in offices and taking them seriously. Sometimes people are so much better off at, at, in my office uh, than they are at home because of the bad environment that they live in, that their blood pressure could be 30 millimeters lower uh, uh, at, in the office. But the, the usual thing that most people have heard of is the office hypertension. And so you really don't know what you have. Now, hyper, office hypertension turns out it does predict future hypertension, but you don't treat that with medications now. Um, you need to have the blood pressures at home. So please, if you're, uh, if you're a physician, nurse, make sure that everybody is giving you the blood pressures at home. And if you are the, the person with hypertension, measuring them at home, even every day if you're taking blood pressure pills. And the reason I, I went off on this tangent is that I've had some patients, based on the data that you're seeing here, I've had some patients get themselves into trouble taking medication for blood pressure that had dropped a lot when they changed their diet and they weren't doing what I asked, which is home blood pressures. So home blood pressures for everyone who's on uh, at risk, uh, has high blood pressure, uh, and it, or is taking medicine or is changing their diet, doing an exercise program, your blood pressure is going to fall. Uh, when you cut back on alcohol, your blood pressure is going to fall. When you lose weight, blood pressure is going to fall and you may not need the same amount of medications. Okay. Um, this is the, some of the evidence that is very graphic. And I pulled it out because everyone talks about the DASH trial, cutting your sodium, uh, cutting back on saturated fat. Well, their DASH actually fell into three different groups. It had some dairy products, but it was uh, not, you know, low in fruits and vegetables, just lowering the sodium, but mm, otherwise it wasn't that good. Uh, and then one that was enriched in fruits and vegetables and fiber, and then one enriched in fruits uh, and vegetables and low in fat and cholesterol, meaning more vegetarian or vegan. 
And you can see the difference in blood pressure is tremendous. The more fruits and vegetables that you have, um, the better your arteries are going to respond. Uh, the nitric oxide uh, that everyone's heard about will actually uh, increase the, um, the ability of the blood vessels to open up and, uh, and relax, which means more blood flow with less blood pressure. How about cholesterol? This is worth looking at because the, the data is even more uniform than it is for high, high blood pressure. And I, I know there's still people going around saying that cholesterol isn't affected by your diet. Whoa, um, there, that amount of data, unless you're a hyper responder, that's what they say. Well, I'd say almost everyone is a hyper responder then. That is when you stop eating animal products, okay, your cholesterol goes down. Now, it's a little more complicated um, than uh, what I'm showing you here. It isn't just you cut back on the animal products uh, and uh, consuming cholesterol and your cholesterol drops. That's part of it, but that's not the whole story. Uh, it's very clear, the, more, the less animals you eat, the lower the cholesterol is going to be. Now, um, and I will get to the rest of that story, but I wanna spend a, just a moment talking about inflammation for a moment because um, there's good data out there that if you go on a plant-based diet, in this case, the portfolio diet published 2003 in the Journal of American Medical Association from David Jenkins at University of Toronto, it was very clear that your LDL cholesterol would go down pretty much like a statin. Now they use lovastatin 20 milligrams, that's kind of a weak statin. Uh, so you may not get that, uh, you might get a, a better response from a full dose statin Lovastatin um, is not as strong as rosuvastatin or, um, or atorvastatin, so-called Lipitor and Crestor. But the, the point was that, if you, that both the statin and the plant-based diet would lower the LDL cholesterol and lower the high sensitivity C-reactor protein. And so you'll hear people, even on this conference, talk about the importance of inflammation, not just cholesterol, but what is your cholesterol, uh, your LDL cholesterol components, how oxidized is it, um, but also um, how much inflammation do you have? And so if you look at the data from Paul Ritker, where he didn't do a vegan intervention, he did a rosuvastatin or Crestor intervention, and the people who had the fall in C-reactive protein and the fall in LDL cholesterol, those are the ones who did by far the best. Now, uh, this was reproduced more recently by Benita Shaw, looking at the prospective uh, trial, curiously uh, or kindly, depending on how you look at it, published in the American Heart Association Journal saying that the American Heart Association diet does not work uh, for lowering um, the inflammation. And so here is your C-reactive protein. When you do a several week intervention with a completely plant-based diet, the C-reactive protein goes down about 30%, just like the, the um, uh, portfolio diet reported 20 years ago. The uh, American Heart Association diet uh, did not do that. Why? Because the American Heart Association diet, the old one before our newest guidelines, really talked about you know, having fish and, and uh, meat, uh, lean meats. So lean meats are a good way to not get overweight really fast, but you're still, when you're consuming the carcass of a uh, deceased uh, animal, you are putting your, yourself at risk uh, of everything that's in that carcass. And that is the, the hormones that were ex excreted into the bloodstream uh, as the animal was uh, being sacrificed uh, and everything that it touched af after that. And it changes uh, uh, the bacterial content, uh, which we're gonna talk about a lot. But the important part is it's a, you're setting up an inflammatory condition and that is always going to be the case. So that was a segue into talking about what really is going on. Hypertension, high, high cholesterol, diabetes and obesity uh, are, really are really controlled by the bacteria in our uh, GI tract, the so-called microbiome. And so this is something that I didn't talk about last year because it just didn't have as much data. Now we do. And, I, and so uh, I'll divide this section of the talk into the four areas here, talking about a chemical trimethylamine in oxide or TMAO. If you're not familiar with it, I'll give you an introduction to it. And then please you know, do a search engine. Uh, it, TMAO searches, reading the literature should come with a warning label that by the time you're done with it, you will be a vegan if you are not already. All right, so let's talk about the microbiome. What in the world are we talking about? 
it turns out, it turns out that more than half of uh, us uh, <clears throat> as humans are not human. Human cells only make up about 43% of the body's total cell count. And, the, and if you go by DNA uh, pairs, it's actually even less. That is, the, uh, we have about 20,000 human genes, but there are 20 million in our body. Well, what is the rest of all this stuff? Well, <clears throat> it's bacteria, it's fungi, fungus, it's um, protozoa and parasites and viruses, and they only weigh up to about five pounds out of our body, but cellularly, they actually overwhelm the rest of our humanity. More importantly, uh, it's not just a numbers game. It's the fact that they have their, they set up their own environment and they put out chemicals and they, uh, they control immunity and they control uh, how much toxins there are in your bloodstream. They control how much inflammation you have. And so you end up with uh, a good or bad digestion or good or bad neurologic system or good and, or bad cardiovascular system based on the species of bacteria that are actually in your GI tract. And so there is a microbiome in your mouth, which can be helpful or harmful. There's, back, there's helpful or harmful bacteria on your skin, uh, but, the, but we're talking about the dysbiotic or a bad microbiome in the GI tract, uh, particularly when it comes to nutrition. And I just I throw this slide up to say that it's really disingenuous as a cardiologist uh, or an internist to talk specifically about the microbiome and not mention neurology because the Alzheimer's disease that we've all seen, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and even autism have been related to a harmful or dysbiotic microbiome. And so the allergies, autoimmune diseases, uh, all of them are actually related to how good the back or harmful the bacteria in your GI tract are. Uh, there's a, been a lot of research and I'd say the last two, two and a half years, trying to figure out what are we doing, uh, bariatric surgery, exercising, all of them can change the microbiome, but individualizing nutrition uh, is really important. You can actually do transplantation of, um, of fecal transplantation, and there are poop pills out there now. Uh, they're, right now they're being used primarily for Clostridium difficile. If you, if you haven't heard of C. diff, that's a good thing, okay? Hopefully you never will, uh, but it's a, a disease that hospitalized patients get that actually can be very uh, uh, damaging in terms of chronic diarrhea. Uh, and it can actually, <clears throat> uh, because that particular bacteria is overwhelming the rest of the bacteria in the GI sy system. And if you put in more benign bacteria, they can actually fight off the C. diff pretty well. Um, and that plus antibiotics can actually do pretty well. So there are a lot of things that can be done to change the microbiome. Please look for this and uh, keep your ear to, to the uh, ground about this because you're gonna see a lot of interventions now that everybody knows that pretty much all of our diseases have to do with the microbiome. And so let's talk specifically about hyper, my big four, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, uh, diabetes, and obesity. So for hypertension, you're just gonna see a whole lot of research. Um, saying uh, in analyzing the gut microbiome in people with hypertension, doing interventions, seeing how it changes and seeing what happens to the blood pressure. The data is very clear that hypertension is not just genetics, not just environmental, that things like dietary fiber, sure, we know that reduces hypertension and, and um, improves inflam inflammation cells. But what we didn't know is that what it's actually doing is improving the so-called alpha diversity. That is the number of uh, bacteria that are good inside your GI tract. That's what the fiber is doing. Uh, fasting actually improves your, your, um, your microbiome and having a lot of gram negative bacteria, Klebsiella and the like are going to be associated with higher bacteria or higher blood pressure. So the hypertension uh, is not totally controlled by the, the uh, microbiome, but it has a very large influence that we're going to have to pay more attention to. Um, there is much more data from uh, many countries now, you're going to see this data all over the place saying that, um, that we need to fix the microbiome in order to change uh, the blood pressure. And so you can see little subtle differences, very little subtle differences, uh, this blue area being larger uh, in people with have blood pressure that are elevated. Uh, and 
it's it's something that we have to pay much more attention to. And they are we may get to the point where changing the microbiome with diet and even the uh, fecal transplants or poop pills uh, could be used instead of the, uh, or in addition to the blood pressure medications that we have. Okay, let's talk about high, high cholesterol. Everybody's worried about their cholesterol because we know that the cholesterol can plug up your arteries when it's too high and you end up with coronary heart disease, heart attack, stroke, and death, and peripheral artery disease and erectile dysfunction and all, all these blood vessel issues. Um, and, but not everybody has heard of the word caprostanol. Most people haven't, unless you're a lipid specialist. Well, it turns out caprostanol is a very important compound. It happens because of the ISMA gene. And it turns out the ISMA gene is in some bacteria that actually will take the cholesterol, uh, and have a, and change it specifically into caprostanol. And so if you have those kinds of good bacteria, then you'd metabolize your cholesterol into caprostanol where it stops being an issue for cardiovascular disease because it goes out in the stool. And so uh, the, less you, the studies will show much less uh, cholesterol being excreted in the stool um, because it turns into caprostanol if you have these kinds of bacteria. How about diabetes? At this point, this, this area is exploding uh, where so many studies are looking at the types of bacteria that are associated with the development of type two diabetes versus um, the uh, treatment of type two by diabetes uh, and less or lowering the risk. And so uh, we actually have multiple, if I had to pick out one to remember, it's the bacterioides. Um, if you have that kind of bacteria, you're going to have uh, a lower risk of type two diabetes. And the opposite is true for Ramunococcus and some of its, its uh, congeners. And so um, you'll see much more literature. I'm just showing you a couple of the studies um, and they, have, they all have complex graphs like this talking about each bacteria and whether or not it's actually increasing the risk or lowering the risk. Uh, positively associated with uh, type 2 diabetes or negatively associated? Is it beneficial? Is it no effect? And uh, it, it looks like a really complex area. Well, it's going to boil down to a handful of species of bacteria that we should have and some that we shouldn't. And, uh, and you probably guessed it already when you're doing, uh, based on my comments, that if you're doing plant-based nutrition, you're getting the good ones. And when you're eating the decaying flesh of a deceased animal, you're getting some of the bad ones. And so all of these species in green are um, ones that will actually um, change the host, but the ones that are blue are, are negatively associated with disease. The ones that are red, Fusobacterium rumunococcus, will actually increase uh, the, the type 2 diabetes. Now let's talk about obesity for a moment because this is probably the biggest area. Uh, we're talking uh, diet and bariatric surgery, the ones that can actually improve outcomes for diabetes are actually uh, related specifically to the changes in the microbiome. And the gut microbiome actually does pretty much all the things you could imagine. You eat a certain amount of food, but how much are you going to, to go out in the stool and how much are you actually going to absorb? Guess what? That's determined by your gut microbiome and the fermentation and absorption of uh, nutrients, uh, fat accumulation, all of it is regulated by the bacteria in the GI tract. And so you have different biochemical levels uh, that, and I would point out the lipopolysaccharides uh, specifically that will actually increase inflammation. Please remember that one because um, that is probably the mechanism for how things go bad in COVID um, with um, the cytokine storm that happens and increasing inflammation when you're obese uh, with a bad diet. Uh, but it's more than just the LPS, it's, uh, it's a variety of hormones and short-chain fatty acids, all of which are actually important uh, for the development of, of uh, obesity and therefore diabetes and hypertension as well. I'm going to switch over and talk about the TMAO, I promised you, um, because, and we've talked about this before, but you may not have heard it, it's something that's so important. Um, we've had this data almost, almost 10 years ago. Uh, Stan Hayes and Wilson Tang coming out in New England Journal of Medicine saying animal products go in, uh, the, the nutrients like choline actually go to your GI flora. If you had those bad bacteria, 
they make trimethylamine and that goes to your liver and becomes trimethylamine in oxide. And what does that do? Heart attack, stroke, and death, we thought. Then the data started getting a lot more complex. So this is their newer slide talking about uh, eating those animal products and resulting in uh, issues of the brain, issues of the liver, issues ultimately of the kidney, as well as the heart. Platelet aggregation, everybody, you know, you may not have heard that term before, but everyone who's got coronary disease and is taking aspirin is to try to stop the little clotting elements, so-called platelets from aggregating, making clots. And that is the mechanism of heart attack and many so-called ischemic strokes. Well, the best way to do that is to drop your TMAO level. And what's the best way to do that is to don't, don't eat animals. And so there's really good data um, that red meat is bad, white meat is a little better, non-meat protein is actually spectacular in terms of uh, getting rid of the production of trimethylamine in oxide. And so what you really want to do is change to away from red meat specifically within four weeks, uh, you will have changed your microbiome. And you, but when you've done that, you will actually decrease the amount of TMAO that you have. Um, and so there, they have done at Cleveland Clinic experiments, washing out, going back and forth, white meat, red meat, uh, soy meat, for example. And you can see the, the TMAO coming and going, particularly with, with red meat. Uh, so what does red meat do? Uh, yeah, I started talking about the, their initial data about heart attack, stroke, and death uh, and platelet aggregation. Let it be known that if you are a plant-based nutrition person, and you have a low TMAO level, you're like an omnivore taking aspirin in terms of your um, ability to uh, have clots form inappropriately. And so having a low TMAO level is precious in that regard. Uh, well, I showed you, uh, or I told you about my heart attack, stroke, and death. You can actually um, measure the TMAO level and you find out that if you have a high level, over time, you're going to have way more events than if you have the lowest level. But we didn't know initially until a, a couple of years after they first started doing this, that it related to heart failure. We know that red meat causes TMAO and red meat causes heart failure. Didn't realize that having an elevated, that highest level of TMAO was basically going to predict death from heart failure patients. So red meat kills, processed red meat kills faster. It's not just cardiovascular disease, it's cancer mortality as well. It's dose related. If you, uh, and for the people who say anything, you know, uh, in moderation, moderate amounts of red meat still has a substantial signal for uh, increased mortality. And again, it's processed meat, red meat way more than red meat. And so if you look at all of the data on, on coronary heart disease, there is no question that unprocessed red, red meat increases it and processed red meat increases death about twice as fast. We have, uh, that was from the UK. We have a similar study from the, uh, of coronary heart disease in the United States. And what they're saying um, is that pretty, and this is from the Harvard uh, Chan public health people uh, saying that pretty much anything you do other than red meat, except in their study, fish didn't do so well, uh, but poultry, eggs, all of them, uh, and again, that makes sense if it's, particularly if it's processed red meat, uh, is going to uh, improve your outcome but you're gonna do way better if you don't do the animal products and you do actually uh, plant-based proteins, particularly soy, uh, it decreases the mortality the best. So I should go back and mention about heart failure because it isn't just coronary heart disease, it's heart failure as well, that you're gonna get a lot more heart failure incidents when you're eating red meat, particularly if you are um, eating processed meat with regularity, that is, what is processed red meat? It's bacon, ham, um, hot dogs, sausages, lunch meat, and I think beef jerky as well um, would count. And so what you end up with is um, more incidence of heart failure and way more incidence of dying of heart failure. So anyone who has heart failure, you want to immediately change that diet uh, so that you don't end up with uh, a bad outcome. This was actually published in an analysis, the regards trial by Kyla Lara, who actually looked at well, what happens to people who, in terms of heart failure, if they do plants instead of the, the regular American diet? 41% lower risk of, of heart failure hospitalizations. Now, uh, switching from coronary disease to heart failure to overall mortality, 
we really should know that um, the components and part of it is going to be TMAO uh, of, of egg consumption uh, is associated with mortality, not quite as bad as processed red meat, but probably worse than unprocessed red meat, that there's a linear association between uh, eating those uh, eggs and dying. And so when this data came out, uh, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, there was a lot of pushback from the egg board and people saying, no, you know, that's just in the United States. Eggs themselves are healthy, but people eat it with uh, refined grains like toast. Um, they're putting jelly and butter on the toast. They're eating it with bacon and ham and eggs or um, with their eggs. And you can't um, distinguish one from the other. Well, that's what statistical adjustment is all about. And eggs come out every time. Uh, as being something that increases mortality. If it's more than a half an egg per, um, per day. Okay, now the proof that it wasn't just the United States was published uh, a, a little later and that was from the Italian population. And they said, oh, it's not a half an egg, it's four eggs a week. Well, that actually is, that's a, instead of 3.5, that's, uh, that's a little more. But the fact of the matter is it increases mortality no matter what. And it's not just cardiovascular disease, it's cancer mortality as well. So. Uh, even two to four eggs per, per week is, uh, increases all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's worse if you have hypertension and high cholesterol, you should not be eating eggs whatsoever. Now, we, so we called out so far red meat um, uh, processed and unprocessed as well as eggs. But I wanna point out that it, uh, these comments uh, apply in, to some degree in pretty much every animal protein. And what you're seeing here is the Journal of American Medical Association. I won't show you all of them, but there are actually three articles with a similar or identical title. Um, and uh, two of them from the United States, but completely different data databases. And one of them from Japan, all showing the same thing. That when you uh, take people who are at risk, okay, and then you substitute plant protein for vegetable um, or plant protein for the animal protein, you will see a decrease in death. And so that decrease of poultry, fish, which people uh, are actually touting as good for you, well, they are in a relative sense. What I tell people is that, yeah, if you're gonna talk about um, processed red meat, uh, that's kind of like eating cyanide, uh, eating poultry and fish would be more like eating arsenic. And so yes, arsenic to, you know, from cyanide would be a great change. Uh, you live longer, um, but it's not the best. And so it turns out that eggs um, are worse than red meat. Uh, red meat is a little worse than dairy. Uh, dairy is a hair worse than fish and poultry, but by far and away, um, processed red meat is the worst. And so uh, that's true for cardiovascular disease and it's very true for all cause mortality. Now. We have other populations. I don't wanna just stick <coughs> on Harvard because there's a lot of other data that supports them. The more plant-based you are, the lower your risk. So uh, this is time varying amount of plants that people are eating. The more plants you eat, the higher your plant-based diet score, the lower your all-cause uh, mortality. And so please, you should be doing at least 80%, if not, you know, or getting your to exclusively plant-based. And then when you do that, your risk of cardiovascular disease goes down. So I, I need to talk a little bit about cardiorenal disease. And I know I spent a lot of time talking about healthcare disparities and um, the fact that our African-American community where I grew up has 21% higher mortality rate, cardiovascular mortality, that we struggle um, with um, a, a variety of diseases, not just obesity, but hypertension, uh, diabetes as well. And when you put all that together, uh, plus a little bit of a genetic predisposition for those of you who are interested as the APOL1 gene, which occurs in about 4% of African-Americans, uh, we're predisposed to having kidney disease. And so here we are uh, with a disease that immediately uh, qualifies people for Medicare. Medicare spends about $91,000 per year on dialysis patients. Um, and the fact of the matter is that we are 13% of the population and 35% of the dialysis patients. So this is very sensitive. Well, people in my family who have been on dialysis and it's like, why can't we do better? Well, the answers are actually here. It turns out that TMAO, 
um, uh, does result in substantial uh, kidney injury. And what I'm hoping that everyone who knows a kidney patient will take a copy of this slide or write it down, send it to that person and have them give it to their doctor. Because I, what I'm seeing is a big disparity. Now, I don't wanna just call out the nephrologist because we have this in cardiology too. Uh, it's on a big meeting you know, a few weeks ago where people were, we were actually talking about the three guidelines that I had personally taken uh, part in writing, hypertension, nuclear imaging, and uh, primary prevention, and saying that nobody's paying attention, nobody's reading the documents, nobody's implementing them. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have any data to, to, uh, to, to refute that. But similar to what is going on in cardiology, we have this issue in nephrology. The kidney doctors seem to be totally unaware, except one guy at Mayo Clinic who sends me patients because they didn't have plant-based uh, cardiologists back then. I haven't heard from him in a while, so hopefully he has plant-based cardiology now. Um, but one, I, I only know of one plant-based nephrologist when this is the most critical thing that a nephrologist could ever learn. And this isn't, you know, uh, the big vegan propaganda journal. This is um, the nephrology journal saying that when you do plant protein instead of animal protein, you stop chronic kidney disease. You lower the incidence, okay? You can make the kidneys heal because the problem the whole time was that animal protein is toxic, toxic to kidneys. If you wanna end up on end-stage renal disease, the best way is to consume red meat. And it's a strong association Everyone should know about it. And it's one of those things that we need to focus more on. It is, the mechanism does involve TMAO and the microbiome, of course, uh, both the development of renal insufficiency and chronic kidney disease. And so poor long-term survival, what do we do? Drop the TMAO level. How do you do that? Change the microbiome uh, by not consuming uh, particularly red meat. This is the National Kidney Foundation. How could that not be widely known? But it doesn't seem to be. They're saying that people should be doing, anybody at risk for kidney disease, diabetic, hypertension, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, needs to be on a plant-based diet. This is the National Kidney Foundation. Uh, this is nature reviews in nephrology, plant-based diets to manage the risk and complications of chronic kidney disease. This is where this all should be going. What are they saying? Animal protein doesn't have any high biological value that, that people are saying that our nutritionists try to tell us the, that plants are the only source of dietary fire, fiber that changes the microbiome and gets rid of the inflammation and the TMAO that leads to um, chronic kidney disease. Plant fats, uh, particularly olive oil, are anti-inflammatory. I know we talked about that yesterday. Uh, for those of you who are on the, um, uh, on, on the uh, session that we did, uh, with the panel, because there were some authors from the, that didn't realize the newer data that this that they really are uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, that the importantly, this one, the plant-based diets have a low amount of acid, which is the the acid from the animal products. Uh, that the overload of amino acids that they get, and the type of amino acids of vegetable plant versus uh, uh, meat. Uh, protein results in the amount of kidney disease. This next one is really huge. They were, I had uh, dietitians in nephrology and dialysis telling my patients to stay away from plants because they had a high amount of phosphorus. Well, if they were looking at it, they would see that most of the phosphorus is bound to phytates. And so it's not going to get absorbed. So you're not worried about the amount of phosphorus. You want to know how much phosphorus is the patient's bloodstream going to have to deal with. And the answer is very little if they are doing a plant-based diet. And so uh, this, the whole idea is that there are citrus and other uh, foods that are really good for uh, giving you potassium. And that when you have chronic kidney disease, uh, first of all, if you're not on end stage, your chronic kidney disease and potassium intake usually isn't a problem. If you can deal with volume, you can deal with potassium, okay? But if you are to, at the point where you can't handle the potassium anymore, uh, well, those people are on dialysis. So this whole idea of restricting plant-based foods uh, doesn't make any sense. All, the, all they have to do is dialyze you with a lower potassium bath, really simple, and, and they're really good at doing that. Okay, I'm gonna switch over and talk about uh, microbiome and COVID illness. 
uh, because we really, throughout this pandemic, should have had the guts to go vegan. No pun intended, and pun's always intended. Okay, and so the, we had this real correlation between COVID lethality and hypertension, cholesterol, um, diabetes, uh, and, high, and, uh, high, and uh, hypertension. And it turns out that, that COVID-19 actually used the cholesterol molecule to get into the cells, reproduce itself. Um, and interestingly enough, we knew that if you did a better lifestyle, and this certainly was my experience the entire time, the people who, in my clinic, even if they weren't plant-based, if they were exercising and they were thin, uh, they could get COVID and they brush it off pretty quickly. But the plant-based, the, the smokers, the obese people, people who were not exercising, they actually ended up with much worse uh, severity. And then this got published. And this really, uh, you know, I challenge anyone, not challenge, ask anyone uh, in the audience, uh, if you know someone uh, who had a, a full-blown, at least, you know, six months going, you know, six months or more of whole food plant-based diet and died of COVID, because I haven't heard of one. It must have happened, but it just seems to be so rare. And so uh, Sarah Seidelman, who actually put out um, uh, the, the data on animal products, I'm sorry, on keto diet and how dangerous it was, uh, she also spearheaded this particular uh, article in British Medical Journal, Nutrition Prevention and Health. And it, what she was saying is that they looked very carefully at diet and COVID-19 severity. You couldn't look at mortality and do this because they didn't seem to find mortality in the plant-based people either. But this is what you want to remember, that the people who were doing a plant-based diet had about a hazard ratio of 0.27. That's a 73% decrease in moderate to severe uh, COVID. Um, the plant-based or pescatarian, uh, obviously adding fish sort of moved it to the right, it lessened the effect. And if you were doing that low carb uh, keto diet, it actually increased um, the likelihood of having moderate to severe illness. So uh, hopefully all the keto people will stop and maybe they'll come back after the pandemic is completely gone. Uh, but even then, uh, I'm hoping they don't. Uh, very important to remember that, that um, if you're doing a plant-based diet, uh, you will have a substantially lower outcome, uh, bad outcome from COVID. Why? Because when you do a, um, a, an analysis of the microbiome, and as I mentioned before, you have a dysfunctional immune response to COVID-19, the cytokine storm that everybody's heard about, you end up with higher inflammatory markers uh, due to the microorganisms. So I hope everyone takes that away. COVID-19 was a virus that killed people because of the bacteria in the GI tract. And that is, modulates the, re, the immune response. You need to change the bacteria to make sure that they're plant-based. How do you do that? Vegan and vegetarian diets. And so for the reasons that I've been talking about for about 30 minutes now, uh, the vegans and vegetarians have those bacterioides um, uh, species going on compared more so than omnivores. And a vegan and vegetarian diet is effective at making a better uh, microbiome and uh, to, to support overall health and uh, alleviate chronic disease. Now, before I close um, and open it up for a discussion, uh, I want to talk a little bit about doing that plant-based intervention uh, because it's not just theoretical. We've been talking about that in the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, and this is indeed one of those guidelines that I wrote or that I helped write that uh, is being largely ignored. Uh, uh, we have data, I can mind saying it in publicly, uh, where we did an internal survey, haven't published it yet, uh, where we asked People we were asking them about COVID vaccine and where they got sick just based on the observations of me and my, my family and my friends and all the vegans took the vaccine and had no problem and the meat eaters then tended to get something that didn't feel good or you know some sometimes they got actually really sick for a little bit of time. Well, I tried to extend that using our our, our doctors, the so medical students, residents, uh, uh, people, anyone who would fill out a a, sur <coughs> a survey. And it turns out that uh, the, we were trying to compare pant, we just didn't have them. 
And this was, you know, Loyola and Rush physicians, and we just didn't have very many plant-based. There were uh, these guidelines that I'm about to show you were being followed by uh, about 5% of our physicians. So we're missing 95%. And you know, we've got to do something about implementation of our guidelines. We've sat around through a couple of years going through all the literature, come up with the guidelines I'm about to show you, I promise, uh, and they're being ignored. Okay, so what are, the, what are those guidelines about? Uh, the cornerstone is diet, of course, but not doing, uh, not doing tobacco, measuring your cholesterol and managing it, measuring your blood pressure and managing it, more physical activity, back off the aspirin. It's not for primary prevention, it's for treatment of disease uh, and control of diabetes, particularly with these newfangled dr drugs. If you are a diabetic and your doctor has not said one of these magic words, GLP-1 or SGLT-2, talk to them to make sure you've seen, you have seen all the commercials on television. It turns out that those uh, drugs have an incredible result. You know, we love our statins for cholesterol and coronary disease. Okay. But, but these drugs are just as good as statins at lowering uh, bad outcomes. They prevent uh, kidney disease. They cause the obesity to improve. They change the, um, they decrease the amount of heart failure and uh, they now have a substantial amount of, um, of data behind them and, and even FDA approval. So um, something to look at if, if you're you know, diabetic or pre-diabetic and no one's talking about these drugs for you. Okay, so, but how about the diet? Let me get back to where we were going. We made five recommendations. And I know I took a lot of heat from my vegan colleagues about uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the fish being in here. Again, it's a, a relative, it's a cyanide versus arsenic kind of thing. The fish was in the randomized trial that showed benefit in primary prevention uh, for the most part, not, not exclusively, not every study, um, but that's how it made it in there because of its relative um, uh, benefits compared to red meat, particularly processed red meat. But this is what people should be eating um, in terms of whole grains, nuts, um, legumes, fruits, and vegetables, and to decrease their cardiovascular risk, they sh we should be getting rid of saturated fat, using more monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. We should be decreasing the cholesterol. And if you take this to its logical numerical extension, decreasing cholesterol and sodium, that gets rid of the fish, obviously. So recommendation three could actually be used to, tr to uh, uh, outdo recommendation number one with the fish thing. Uh, because fish has cholesterol. Um, uh, as part of a healthy diet, important to uh, minimize, uh, and I would say eliminate processed red meat, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened beverages. Uh, why, didn't, why doesn't it say eliminate instead of minimize? Because pretty much all the literature that supports this, and the literature is strong, uh, it talks about doing less. And you know what is the optimum dose? I would say it's zero. Um, but, you know, when people ask, like they did on the panel yesterday, well, can I do a little bit? Um, well, the answer is we don't know that for everything. I would say the processed meat, uh, eggs do have uh, a linear relationship. If you have a large enough population, that'll reach physical significance. Uh, but we don't know what necessarily what the safe limit is for things that are so harmful. Uh, but, what, but the question is, why would you ever? All right. And lastly, we don't have to worry about number five, because that's illegal in the United States, Denmark, Switzerland, and, and uh, Canada to serve trans fats. Okay, so what is this? So we took our, our, uh, those guidelines uh, and starting in um, uh, February of 2019, uh, you, know, you might wonder, how did I start in February 2019 when the document was published in March of 2019? Well, I was on the committee, so I knew what I was gonna say. So I designed a trial to test and see what would happen if we went on, uh, if we followed the ACCHA guidelines without the fish, of course, uh, on the risk factors in an at-risk population on the south side of Chicago. And so they gave up for Lent, uh, instead of giving up cigarettes for Lent or soda pop for Lent, uh, they gave up animal products and they ate, they promised to only eat the food that we sent them, whole food, plant-based diet, uh, three meals a day for five weeks. And this is what happened. They lost 10 pounds. They lost 10 millimeters off the blood pressure. And the, the blood pressure loss, you really couldn't work on that statistically because they were backing off of their blood pressure medicine. So the effect was probably even stronger than what it looked like. Um, the, the TMAO level that I've talked so much about went down by 43%. That was matched by a drop in insulin. That's because their fat content went down. 
And so insulin creates fat and plaque and insulin resistance. So the higher the insulin level, the more you absorb of your nutrients, which makes you fatter and the more insulin resistance you get so that your insulin levels end up higher. And so that's how you become diabetic, pre-diabetic, central obese, and it dropped 43% in the five weeks. There were other really good things, less inflammation, lower LDL cholesterol, and on and on and on. But the, the risk was tremendously better. Uh, when we looked at uh, our risk calculator, please, if you don't have this on your, on your phone, uh, this is an app that you can get, ASCVD risk calculator, and you, you know, take it to your next family dinner and say, hey, you know, Uncle Joe, what was your last cholesterol? What was your last blood pressure? Uh, how old are you now? You put all the stuff into, the, into your risk calculator and find out if somebody's more than um, uh, 7.5% risk, which means that they really need an intervention. Well, it turns out that uh, out of that 21% uh, increase in cardiovascular mortality that we had in our African-American population that we knew about, we had about 19% of that risk eliminated based on risk factors. Now, obviously, this is a 10-year risk. You obviously would have to do the diet for 10 years uh, to get that uh, reduction, uh, but that's where it was headed. Now, we actually did publish, based on the guidelines, a plant-based uh, diet for that is for anyone, but it's kind of geared toward the African-American community. Uh, I would, it's uh, published by the Association of Black Cardiologists. Uh, I, you know, I know I'm a co-author, but to be honest, I was really like the idea person. The person who did most of it was Baxter Montgomery because he actually does cooking and classes and stuff like that and it's in addition to cardiology. That's on the Association of Black Cardiologists website um, under the, um, the patient information. Please pull that up and you can share it with everyone. So in summary, uh, the, I, would, I would say that uh, we have really good information in this dual pandemic that the heart disease, kidney disease, stroke, all this stuff that's increasing is being driven by our diet and our lifestyle choices, less exercise than we should be doing, and it's conferred by the microbiome. And it does con continue to increase our health inequities and ethnic disparities. And if we were, the answer is to do plant-based nutrition. It will lower the rates of diabetes, obesity, give us a, the longer life expectancy that everyone should, should, be, should have available to them and lower all of these diseases that you see listed, all of which are actually mediated by the microbiome that we spent so much time talking about. So I would say in our dual pandemic, we ought to be advocates for risk factor re re reduction. We should be talking to our congressmen. Well, don't you see this data about plant-based nutrition and COVID death? Why do we accept the death and the expense of COVID when we could just, uh, you know, the vegans are still gonna get it, they're just not gonna get sick and they're not gonna fill up the hospitals and expose all of our healthcare workers. And so why do we have to put up with this when we, when we could have done plant-based nutrition? Now, I would say uh, just, just one other piece of information. Uh, this is actually post the lecture. I'm done talking about cardiovascular stuff. Uh, I just wanted to say that I've, I've been telling people um, that uh, they really need to look at the mortality rate for eating beef. It's 100% for the cow. I know I've been infected by all my <laughs> animal rights people, um, but you know, people ought to pay a little bit more attention to the creations that we have on this earth and, and be a little bit kinder, uh, kinder and, and, and friendlier to both the environment and to our, our colleagues and other species because uh, you know, doing that would actually help our own health. Um, lastly, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna mention just animal rights or animal cruelty without saying something about uh, our, now that I have nine grandkids, I'm like suddenly in, in interested in the environment. Well, you know, I, was, I got a hybrid car so I could have less emissions. Well, what was I doing? Well, it turns out that, that cars are not nearly as bad as beef. And um, the, the fact of the matter is that greenhouse gases are like 23 times more potent uh, for warming the planet. So I would say these are things that we need to, to and for every reason that I've talked about, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, car, um, renal disease, the planet, uh, the, that's the whole concept of um, you know, honoring some animals and abusing others. 
we all need to change our diets and we need to convince everybody else to do so. And with that, I'm going to take questions for exactly eight minutes. Uh, I, I know we were scheduled to go a little longer, but I had a family conflict. So I have to leave here at 115 Central, um, but I'm hopefully to get as, to as many questions as I possibly can. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, Real Truth. Um, thank you so, so much, Dr. Williams. Again, just, just a real privilege for all of us to have you present here today and share what you shared. And uh, we got it about your time. We'll make sure we get you out on time. And uh, with that, I'm going to jump right into questions. Um, I have a few raised hands already. For those of you that want to try to get one in, you can click on your reactions tab in your Zoom window and raise your virtual hand from there. And I'm going to jump right in with Kaylee. Kaylee, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. Uh, this question is actually from last night's panel that I didn't get to ask. Um, my husband, who's going to be 80 in two months, um, smoked two packs a day from ages 13 to 33. The last five years, he's been a solid SOS-free vegan, no exceptions. Um, we want to know about B12 because you mentioned a study that start, came out three months ago, but I didn't get what it was, please. Oh, uh, Dr. Williams, you're, you're muted. Isn't that like a $10 fine? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, um, I would have to run that through my search engine again to pull up the reference for you. I remember the facts, not the, not the reference, but it's easily findable. It was, uh, and, and so my understanding of that when I read that paper is that if you were ever a smoker that you, you never get, just so you know, to, for everybody, when you're stopping smoking, you actually decrease your um, cardiovascular event rate down to that of a non-smoker in about three years. It actually follows your fibrinogen level drop, okay? Your cancer risk never goes away, okay? Similarly, uh, you can reduce your cancer risk by reducing the cigarettes, like uh, one pack a day down to one cigarette a day. That's a 20 fold decrease in the risk of cancer. But that one cigarette a day would not reduce your cardiac event rate. So they're kind of very disparate. Okay. So I'm off on a little bit of tangent there, but just, just to say with that background, your, your cancer risk never goes away. And it turns out that if you were a smoker, that the uh, high dose B12, high meaning more than 55 micrograms per day, which is really so small, it's hard to do. How many do you need? You need about eight micrograms per day. Uh, the, but more than 55 does actually uh, seem to be associated, if, if not promoting, uh, the incidence of lung cancer. Thanks very much for that, doctor. And up next, we're going to bring in uh, Elaine. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Williams. First, I just want to thank you for, I think you're the best doctor we've had in, in this two weeks. And Rush, you represent Rush so well. My cardiologist is Dr. Tochi at Rush. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, yeah, so I just think the world of that institution. I do have a question on ketogenic diet. I agree with you on all the aspects that you've talked about, but in the case of cancer, active cancer, is there room to discuss and consider a ketogenic approach in a short-term pulsed fashion for the sake of killing active cancer? And I, I'm asking that based on Dom Diagostino's <clears throat> research on ketosis in a hyperbaric chamber. He's a well-known researcher in that area. So I, I would love to see outcomes on that. Uh, I can tell you that the basic science would go exactly opposite of that. Um, I, I kind of thought you were going to go with the diabetes and the fact that um, that the weight goes down, the uh, hemoglobin A1C goes down, the blood pressure goes down because the weight went down that there are some benefits, um, you know, but the fact of the matter is, this is really, uh, uh, the, the basic science says that animal protein actually increases um, cancer growth. And so referring to Dean, it may not be true of all cancers. You, you've seen the data from Dean Ornish about, you know, stable prostate cancer, watchful waiting, eat plants, uh, they do well, eat animals, they gradually increase. And then doing the in vitro part, meaning in a test tube or in a Petri dish, 
where the plant, the serum of plant-based people inhibited growth and animal protein increased growth. You know, I'm not an oncologist, but I certainly have had um, several cases, and I hate to talk about anecdotes, um, but, you know, there were people close to me where they were doing pretty well, they were stable, their scans looked good after chemo, radiation, therapy, and surgery, and they were doing pretty well, but they had gone plant-based and they were thin and had an oncologist say, you're too thin. Why? Not sure. Uh, and say, go ahead and uh, go ahead and eat <clears throat> Uh, animal products to try to gain weight and then see the cancer growth. Uh, was that your comment that you? I, I, yeah, I just saw that. Yep, that's from her. Yeah, yeah. I have nothing, so I still I still don't know the answer. Other than all of the stuff I just said is for everybody's information. Uh, I would say that uh, that um, I would not be surprised if if any kind of plant based regimen inhibited the growth of cancer, because that's what the basic science says. Uh, I, all I know is the cardiovascular mortality stuff is very clear. Uh, that's the Seidelman article, Sarah Seidelman that I mentioned earlier. Uh, her publication said that if you do a keto diet with animals, it's an 18% increase in death. And if you do it with plants, it's an 18% decrease in death. Uh, got time for one more, please. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go to David R. Welcome, David. Hi, thank you for the great presentation, doctor. Um, because of a family history, I did uh, three years ago a CAT scan, and, and I find out that uh, my score was relative, relatively high. I changed my lifestyle to be full vegan. And uh, I would like to ask you, how would you recommend to, to test if you know, my situation been improved or not? Would you recommend to do the CAT scan again? or because of radiation, are there any other type of test that you would recommend to test if my situation been improved by switching the lifestyle? So you just happen to be talking about my favorite topic. Thank you very much. Gosh, and I only have two minutes left. I would love to talk about this for a good 10 or 15. All right, so let's back up and clue everybody else in. When you say the CT scan, what you're really saying, I'm presuming, is a coronary calcium score, okay? And you don't have to tell me what the score is, but I wanna tell you, that we have specific guidelines. Um, uh, so first of all, the disclaimer is <clears throat> that when you, just because your score is zero doesn't mean that you're cardiac immortal, but it's darn good. And so if you happen to have a score of zero, the odds of you having a cardiac event in the next decade is actually extremely low. That's the MESA trial. The MESA trial, they call it the power of zero. Now, if you're not one of those people that has a zero, because like you said, your risk or your lifestyle beforehand, um, then you could end up with some calcium. We used to give everybody a statin and an aspirin. Nowadays, we realize that aspirin is actually dangerous. And that's why in our guidelines, you know, hashtag re rethink aspirin, we use it when people really need it. And so we draw a line in the sand at a score of 100. And some people on our committee were saying, well, you know, maybe we should have drawn it, in, we should have drawn it at 300. So I won't ask you what your score is, but just remember what I'm saying. If it's above 300 for sure, and probably if it's more than 100, you need to take an aspirin or an aspirin substitute that like uh, clopidogrel, Plavix seems to be taking over. Every study is saying, why are we doing this? Yeah, we've had aspirin for a long time, but clopidogrel is safer. It's no longer expensive. We shouldn't be putting up with all the GI bleeding and intracranial bleeding when we could just use um, Plavix or if clopidogrel instead of aspirin. So you're probably going to see that over time switch. Okay. But that's only if you're in the hundreds. If you're between a score of zero and 100, it's only a statin. And I always would recommend that you treat the coronary disease um, that's significant uh, with my so-called SAVE program that I mentioned last night. SAVE, those four letters standing for a statin, antiplatelet drug, whatever it is, if it's indicated, a vegan diet and an exercise program. Now, if you have a massive amount of coronary calcium, you then really should be uh, finding out like, pitching and baseball or real estate, it's location, location, location. If it's really up in the left main and it's, uh, or the, pro the top of the artery that goes down the front, those really need to be uh, fully evaluated more than likely with a stress test to make sure it's safe to do that, the, the E part of SAVE. Um, and, but that leave that up to you and your doctor to figure that one out. Um, then, but what you're really asking is how do you follow it? Well, hopefully um, what you're going to see is that the data is very clear that following it within five years is probably not 
what something you should do if your score is above 100 because you're already not going to change your, your management. And statins increase your calcium score. How does that happen? It's healing of plaque. Statins heal plaque. They reduce heart attacks by getting the plaque, uh, as does a, a plant-based diet, as does Evolocumab. You have good data for each one of those uh, uh, therapies at lowering the amount of vulnerable plaque. That is the low fat, I'm sorry, the high fat uh, plaque that, that's inflammatory becomes hard as a rock and will never hurt you. And so you expect the calcium score to actually go up over time. Um, and so the only time to, and you know, and this is something that we haven't dealt with in the guidelines, but well, wait a minute, it was 90 before, and now it's 102. And now I'm going to go on aspirin when what really happened is that it healed. So why am I going on the aspirin? That's a, one of those questions that we just aren't able to answer yet, but we do know that the calcium score should go up uh, with good therapy. Now, the bad news is if your cholesterol is out of control, your diabetes is out of control, you're eating animals all the time and your blood pressure is out of control, your score will go up. But the score is going up because the disease is getting worse, not more stable, but getting disease is getting worse. And so how do you distinguish those two? You probably would need a CT angiogram. Uh, and I do want to address the, what you mentioned about radiation. The radiation burden is something that we're very sensitive to with CAT scanning in children and maybe young adults. But by the time you get to uh, of above age 40, it's the odds of you getting a malignancy from diagnostic uh, testing is actually extremely, extremely low. And so we don't worry about it. I mean, there, there's extrapolations that if you did a nuclear stress test, which is a little more than a set CAT scan uh, in terms of radiation, every year for 40 years, you might catch up to the uh, native amount of uh, radiation burden um, in terms of inducing malignancies that you would get from uh, uh, the cosmic radiation of just walking in the sun. Okay. Um, I know I've got to go, but I, there is someone asked what the A is in, uh, save it would be antiplatelet. It used to be, it used to be aspirin, statin, aspirin, vegan diet, exercise, not aspirin anymore, necessarily. It's just antiplatelet drugs, um, like aspirin, the, the substitutes seem to be better. Uh, thank you so much for that, Dr. Williams. Thank you for taking the questions that you could take now for always coming back to us year after year, uh, so needed and, and wanted to have you here. So uh, with that, I want to thank you, but I know uh, everybody wants to thank you. So tech team, please unmute our entire audience. What do you want to say to Dr. Williams? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.